another series of lessons on what the Holy Ghost is for. And last week, uh, we left off with it being a sanctifier. The Holy Ghost is a sanctifier, or it is a separator. And I, I just want to say you know, along those lines that it's important for us to understand that when the Holy Ghost separates, it's separating for a purpose. People separate for their own ideas, and there's a difference between that. We might use scriptures, come out from among them, and be ye separate, but oftentimes man uses that to create division and problems. That is not what the Holy Ghost does. When he says, come out from among them and be ye separate, he's really talking about the things that the world is doing that is against God. Amen. We should not be participating in those things. Amen. But he didn't ask us to separate ourselves off and, and do like some preachers say, you know, the Bible says that we are, uh, well, uh, that we are, they, they, preachers like to say we're odd. We're not odd. How does the scripture go? Um, say what? Oh, I, I, I lost the scripture that I was thinking of. But the scripture is not asking us to be strange. It's not asking us to be weirdos. The scripture is asking us to stand out from the world and the things that the world is doing. You don't have to walk around with a banner and you don't have to walk around rebuking folks constantly to be different. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, some people, well, she said that some people act like we're in a cult, but some of that is our fault that folks think that because we separate ourselves off and won't talk to certain people. The scripture I was thinking about is we are peculiar people, and they take that word to mean that we're strange and weird, and then we act strange and weird, and then we don't understand why folks say, y'all strange and weird, because that's not what he's saying. That word really means a contrast to something. So if, and, and I'm not saying that everything that's leveled, every accusation that's leveled against the people of God is, is our fault, but what I'm saying is that there are times when we act in a way that's so unfriendly and so different and doing things like this. Um, Someone I ask you to do something that you know is a sin. The Bible says it's a sin. And the first thing you do is say, well, my church teaches against. Well, and after a while, they think it's your church and not the Bible. So when we say things like that or, hey, you want to go do thus and so with me? Well, let me ask my pastor and see if it's okay. That's the kind of stuff that makes people think that you're in a cult. The safest ground to be on is the word of God. Amen. When you know what the Bible says, when you know what the Bible teaches, it doesn't really matter after that what anybody else says because I know what the Bible says. And I'm not going to do it or I'm going to do it. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. If someone says that they cheating on their wife and, hey, you come with me, uh, I got a, she's got a girlfriend that's real cute, you come with me and you say, well, my church teaches against that. They just going to think it's a, your church issue. But when you say, but the Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery, it doesn't matter what your church says. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Or what the pastor says. Yes. Yeah, I've folks will get tripped up and instead of saying let me go study they'll say well let you should you should call my pastor he'll tell you 
you should know your Bible. Amen. 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 That's the reason why the scripture says that when he, that is the spirit of truth come, he shall lead you and guide you into all truth. That's one of the things that the Holy Ghost does for us. It guides us into truth. Amen. So another thing that the Holy Ghost does for us, it's a unifier. The Holy Ghost unites people. If you go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. And another scripture that we're going to read is some antidote to those who would be creating division. The first one, though, is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of the body, of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew, Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Now, I know there are those who feel like there's many ways that you can get to heaven, but there's only one spirit. Matter of fact, Ephesians 4 and 5 says there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is through you all and in you all or something like that. You, you, know, you know what I'm saying. One, 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 one. Not a whole bunch of different things, a whole bunch of different ways. We are one body. So, Let's consider this. The scripture says that there is one body, and if you look at our bodies, the example that he's giving, there's only two index fingers on your body. That's it. Just two. And just about anything you cut off your body won't grow back. And so it's important that the body be whole. My hand, and, and, and the apostle talks about this, the hand shouldn't be jealous of the eye. The ear shouldn't be jealous of the eyes, and the eyes shouldn't be jealous of the mouth. Now let me ask a question. What's the most important part on the body? The brain? The heart? Anybody else? The soul? You say they all important. <laughs> they are they are all important. For those who said the brain, then if someone cut your heart out, what you gonna do? Alright, for those that said the heart, let's say they take your brain. Okay, forget that. Keep your brain and your heart. Let's just take your lungs. We need all of it. It all serves a function. One of the things that we have used as a tool of division is the church. And yet the Bible says the Holy Ghost should bring us all together in one. Did you have a question? She said, even though her feet, we might think that the feet are not that important, hers brought her to her knees when they, when they started hurting her. Well, uh, try not having hands. How are you going to open up something? You, yeah, it's going to be tough. So, well, all we have to do is watch those who are handicapped. You can see how difficult it is. But you don't know how difficult it is. It, yeah, until you actually have gone through something. I had surgery done on my elbow many years ago. 
and was shocked at how much I used my arms and my hands. I couldn't button up my own clothes. You can't button up your shirt with one hand. You might be able to, but it's a hard thing to do. It was hard for me to take a shower. Just got one hand. How do you get the soap? You know what I'm saying? It's a tough thing. We need all of the parts. So why then is the church having so many problems? One of them is because we're not letting the Holy Ghost unite us. We're doing... In many cases, we're doing what the scripture says. We're using the Holy Ghost as a cloak or the spirit as a cloak of maliciousness. We use it as a tool to beat up people. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, this is not talking, when he says there is neither male nor female, he's not talking specifically about our gender orientation. He's talking about when it comes to the things of God, anybody can do the work of the Lord. Male or female. Now, one of the reasons why this was put in here was because at the time of this writing, in Jewish culture, women were not permitted to come into the synagogues. You know why? All right, I'm going to leave that alone. That'll be another Bible class. But here's the thing. Women were not permitted to come into the church. There were certain things that that happened with women that made them unclean. And anything they touched was unclean. And if they came into church and was touching stuff, they made the things inside the church unclean. So you know what they did? They made them go stand outside or go up into a balcony that was high up so that they couldn't even look over. As a result, when there was neither male nor female, bond nor free, when that came in, Women started coming to church. Churches were in the homes at this time. Women started being a a, a participant in church. What did they know about it? Absolutely nothing. They weren't permitted to go to church. So when they get there, they were doing like some young saints do. They say, well, let's open our Bibles. Young saint will raise a hand. When you say open your Bible, what does that mean? Let's open our songbooks to page... 392. The reason why you open a 392, is that what you're supposed to do every service, or is that just something that somebody just picks off the top of their head? This is what the women were doing. They didn't know what was going on, so they kept constantly interrupting service asking. And so the apostle said, well, let them be quiet. Let the women be silent in the church. Yeah. He said, let them be silent in the church, and if they have a question, then go home and ask their husband. He wasn't saying that women shouldn't talk in church. He was dealing with the issue of interrupting service. The Apostle Paul later deals with those who were standing. He said, when you come to church, one group is over on the side singing a song. Another group is standing and talking about the Bible. Another group is standing and speaking in tongues. Everything is all out of order. Did he mean no more singing in the church? No. Let everything be done properly. Let it all be done in order. And so the thing that we should cling on to is the fact that in, once we get saved, the Spirit gives us equality across the board. When you go to a church, the people are saved. They're filled with the Holy Ghost. They are following the spirit. You can have someone with a doctorate degree or two doctorates and someone that has got nothing higher than a fourth or fifth grade education and they can get right along with each other. You can have a rich person 
and someone that can barely hang on to the house that they're living in, barely hanging on to it, and they get right along with each other. The Holy Ghost, the Spirit, it takes out all the division when you're letting it follow, when you're letting it lead you. It, it removes all those barriers. You can have black people, white people, Asians, Hispanics, all in one church, all getting along with each other because they all have one spirit. I, I don't know who said this. It, it, it's quoted often that um, someone said that they've never seen I'm, I'm, I'm going to get it wrong, so I'll give you the essence of it. That Sunday morning is where uh, you see the most amount of segregation and racism in this country because everybody goes to the church of their own nationality. So you've got Hispanics all going to a Spanish church, and you've got Koreans all going to a Korean church, and white folks all white church, and black folks all in a black church. It's just all segregated, but that is not what the Holy Ghost does. That's what man does. Man says, let's worship with people that are like us. Well, when you have the Holy Ghost and everybody else has the Holy Ghost, y'all all like each other, aren't you? All right, let's just read this again. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, right? It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. You both got the Holy Ghost, you're both the same thing. It doesn't matter whether you're a worker or an employer. It doesn't matter. If you both got the Holy Ghost, you're both on equal footing. Yes, ma'am. Mixed? She said, your mother said that she never went to a white church or a black church. She always went to a mixed church. Amen. No. Nope. When we, when we get to heaven, it's going to be a whole different thing altogether. Ain't going to be no color there anyway. Right. I, I think the movie was, can't think of the name of it, where when the lady that was the housekeeper and cook died. She said, the, the lady that owned the house said, well, I hope when she gets to heaven, she gets a good place in, in the kitchen. Ain't gonna be nothing like that. that my grandmother said that? Oh, so the so, so, uh, lady that my grandmother worked for said that about her, that when she died that she hoped that she got to be in heaven's kitchen. Heaven ain't got no kitchens. Ain't nothing needing to be cleaned up in heaven. Amen. You, I, don't, I don't foresee us all sitting around God's great banquet table all eating. It ain't going to be like that. Not at all. The Holy Ghost unites us. The Holy Ghost causes us to be one. Yes, ma'am. You know, that's, that's been something that has bothered me for a long, long time. And everybody can't because of the fact that we're all Christians. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, you know, people living as opposed to have the Holy Ghost. And I never could understand the separation. How can you not want a black person? So now, she's saying that the, that's something that she has never understood, the, this division that there is sometimes in organizations, how one will want white folks and the other black folks. And I'm going to tell you something. For many years, I felt like uh, there were organizations that were racist or prejudiced and didn't want black folks in it until um, the first person that I knew that was white that got the Holy Ghost here. And he said, he uh, went, we went to church somewhere, and he said when he went in and sat down, folks got up from their seats and moved from him. 
So it's not just white folks that's prejudiced. It's just folks that's prejudiced. And let me just tell you something about that. It seems to be a burr in the saddle of black folks in this country. But don't be deceived. There is prejudice of all kinds. You can get a group of folks together that's all one color and they'll find a reason to hate each other. They'll find a way to cause division among themselves. It'll be money. The rich folks live on this side of town and the poor folks live on that side of town. All of those who have good educations, we all live over here and those who are not educated, the common working class, they live over there. People find a way to make division. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. She's, she said that uh, among, even among black people, there's, uh, she's heard comments about light skin and dark skin. People will find something. Yes, ma'am. But I, I understand all of that, but who's the Holy Ghost? Yes. She says she understands that, but we're supposed to have the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, if you allow it to lead you, brings you about all that foolishness. Right. Stops all of that. Now, now, I'm not speaking for the person present. You may be missing it. The apostle Peter did, and Paul had to go and withstand him to his face because Peter, Paul said he, had, he was causing dissimulation among the brethren. He was causing division among the brethren. When the Jews came around, he separated himself from the Gentiles and only hung out with the Jewish brothers. But eventually Peter got himself together. So I'm not saying then that the person that does something like that at this moment, ooh, you in big trouble. Only God knows whether they will eventually get themselves together. But the bottom line is this, the Holy Ghost will lead you out of that. You keep on bucking the Holy Ghost. And after a while, he won't try to lead you no more. Yes, ma'am. She said that, uh, she, who was it? Well, not, I'm not asking for a name. You were just saying it was a man or somebody that had gotten the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Two young people had gotten the Holy Ghost. And she said, well, let's just wait and see. If, if they have the Holy Ghost, it'll make a difference. And if it doesn't, then something's wrong. And I'm going to be honest. I think, I don't know what kind of spirit some people are getting today. I've never heard of people who can get the Holy Ghost today and backslide two days later. Never heard of nothing like that. I mean, this is, this is unusual. And I'm not saying that they don't have the Holy Ghost. I, I don't know. I really don't. But it is unusual. How do you get filled with the Spirit of God? And the next day, I, I saw a woman. I personally saw her. Get the Holy Ghost. And later on that afternoon, I said, how are you feeling? She said, a little depressed. How do you get the Holy Ghost and you're depressed? I don't understand that. Now, the best thing for me to do is to not try to decide whether somebody really had the Holy Ghost or not. I've heard people, you know, say some foolish things. A person has been in, been, uh, in church for, had the Holy Ghost for 15, 20 years, and eventually they backslide for something. And somebody else say, I knew they didn't have nothing uh, anyway. Like, how did... The, the presumption is that once you get the Holy Ghost, you can never backslide. That's not true. You can have it, be on fire for the Lord for a long time, and eventually start to drift away. 
And once you drift away, I don't care how long you've had the Holy Ghost. 50 years, 60 years you could have the Holy Ghost and then start to drift away and you're 59. And then by year 60, backslide. And you get no credit for the 59 years that you was living right. But that doesn't mean you didn't have it. All right. So the Holy Ghost is a unifier. When we allow it to work like it should, there is no divisions. There is no isms and schisms. There is no walking into a church and certain folks sit off by themselves and don't speak to other people. I've seen that come in. Now listen, I'm going to tell some of our dirty business because it happened many, 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 many years ago, probably 30, more than 30 years ago. I can remember when you come in here, depending on which side you sat on, made a difference because there was some folks here. If you sat on the side opposite of where they sat, you was their enemy now. They had their own little camp set up. If you sat, if they sat over here and you sat over there after service when you were shaking hands, you they just gave you a limp hand. They stuck it out there. Oh, praise the Lord, but they weren't shaking it. That was to let you know you should have sat over on my side. It created problems. That's not the Holy Ghost. That's just flesh. And let's be fair. That's not even the devil. That's not the devil. That's just flesh. That's pride. That's all. The, by, the, the Holy Ghost also is a keeper. It'll help you keep yourself under control. In the book of Galatians chapter 5. In verse number 16. He says this. This I say then. Walk in the spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. When you have the Holy Ghost and you are walking in the Spirit, there is no such thing as, and the next thing I knew, that doesn't happen. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Amen. I've, I've heard people say that. I was just doing this and so, and the next thing I know, and it was something that they did that was a sin. No, you didn't. Right, one, 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 one man said, my wife and I got into a fight. We was arguing and I just got so upset. I lost, I lost my temper, lost my mind. Next thing I know, I'm sitting up at the bar with a beer in front of me, half drunk. I'm like, no. Somehow your mind knew how to get your keys, how to start your car, how to drive it. How to go in and say, I'd like a beer. However they order it. He knew how to order it. And then knew how to drink half of it. When you're walking in the spirit, there are no and the next thing I knew moments that happen in your life. How many times does Jesus find himself pent in in a corner and the next thing he knew he had to do something to to get out of it that was wrong. Never. You know why? Because of a statement that he made. I do always those things that please the Father. When we can do that, the Holy Ghost will help you keep your flesh under control. Hello? How about this? You can be tempted by men and the Holy Ghost will help you have good sense. You can be tempted by women. The Holy Ghost will help you have good sense. You can be tempted to blow up, lose your temper and get out of order. And the Holy Ghost can keep you from doing that. The Holy Ghost can help you to leave the money laying on the counter and walk away because you know it ain't yours. Holy Ghost can help you do that. Yes, ma'am.
They did. <laughs> she said she said she was at the bank last week and uh someone that was ahead of her pulled out and left the envelope in the the tube and she got it out and looked in it it had 20s and 10s in there and she put it back in the thing and sent it up and said that the person ahead of her left it but uh it they had cameras anyway <laughs> yes i'll let you in on a secret when you let the holy ghost keep you you can be in a dark room all by yourself with no cameras nowhere and you still do the right thing Amen. I knew you would have done the right thing anyway. The Holy Ghost will keep you from allowing your flesh to do what it wants to do. If we are honest, every single one of us has something in us. Sometimes I feel like I've got a few things in me. Every one of us has got something that we fight. And the Holy Ghost can help you to keep away from that. It can help you to keep your flesh under control. I don't know what your problem is, but you do. I don't know what your temptation is, but you know what it is. The scripture says there is no temptation that has taken you except that which is common to man. You're not tempted by God. You're tempted by what? Who tempts you? She said, the devil. Now the Bible says you're tempted and drawn away by your own lust. It ain't the devil. It's you. There's coming a time, and, and this is an, another Bible class altogether, but there's coming a time during, I think it's the millennial reign, yes, when the devil and his angels are bound for a thousand years, and you know what? Man's still going to cut up. You know why? Because it ain't all the devil. When the devil, when the serpent tempted Eve, what did he tell her? What was his temptation? You shall not surely die. For in the day you eat thereof, God knows that you'll, be, you'll become as gods, knowing good and evil. And then what else did he say? What else did he tell her? Huh? You don't know? That's because he didn't tell her nothing else. The devil, the devil is not sitting. You know how they have on, on you see little TV commercials with the devil on one side and the angel on. It's not like that. The devil's not bothering you all the time. You know who's bothering you? You bothering you. Your flesh wants something. You can be fasting. It's not the devil that's tempting you with food. It's your flesh that wants to eat. Hallelujah. But the Holy Ghost... It'll help you when you walk in the spirit. It'll help you to not fulfill the lust that are in your flesh. And your flesh has them. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh, okay. So the next thing is that the Holy Ghost is for, it is an assurance. It's the earnest of our inheritance. So go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of 
his glory. We sing that song, I've been redeemed. You have been, but you ain't completely out of it yet. What we have is the earnest. Do you know what earnest is? Anybody know what earnest is? Anybody ever bought a house? You have? When you bought it, you didn't just walk up to the realtor and say, hey, I want that house. And they said, oh, okay, well, you're the first one to ask. We'll go ahead and let you. They don't do that. What do they ask for? Yes, ma'am. She said, it's like a portion, and you say it's money. You're right. You're both right. Earnest money is money that says, I'm not just talking. I mean this. So they ask for an amount of money that's non-refundable to demonstrate that you're serious. You're not just out putting bids on every house you come to, but you have a, an earnest bid. You have a, a real desire to get it. So if you back out and you don't have a good reason, you don't get your money back. So if someone says, we're asking for earnest money, $1,000, Who's going to walk away from $1,000 on a house just to put a bid in to see if they could get it? So unless there's something that happens like the bank denies your loan or there, there are stipulations that go along with it. I don't know what they all are. I used to. If you don't meet those stipulations, you don't get your money back. But what it demonstrated was how serious you were about this. The Bible says that we have been purchased with the blood of Jesus. We have been redeemed. But the redemption is not complete yet. What we have right now with the Holy Ghost, that's just the earnest of our inheritance. That's just the portion that says, look, y'all, I'm serious about this. Do you want to go to heaven? Well, here's how serious I am. I've put down the price for your redemption. And when I come back, I'm going to get you. But only if you still have that seal of redemption on you. If you don't have it, you're not his. Um, having this something, the Lord knoweth them that are his. God knows those that belong to him. God knows that have the Holy Ghost in them. God knows the ones that's been following behind the Holy Ghost. He knows that. And so the Holy Ghost is the earnest that God has put down. Why would he do that? Does anybody have any idea why God would put earnest down instead of just promising and saying, hey, that's it? Do you even know what the earnest is? Nobody? The Holy Ghost, right. That is the earnest. Now, why does God do that? Because we have to face some dangers, some things, some problems in our life that our flesh could easily manhandle. And so God gave us a taste of what we have to come. David said it like this, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trust in him. He didn't say you get the full meal. He didn't say you get a full portion. Oh, taste and see. Don't we do that before we sit down and eat? Now, my wife does something. She'll do this. She'll, if she's not too sure about it, she'll pick it up and look at it. she smell it first. If it passed the smell test, then she'll... Take a little taste of it. That little taste is just a sample to see whether I like it or not. The Holy Ghost is just a sample. This isn't everything. Think about the best you have ever felt under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. He said the best of that is just the earnest. That's just the taste of what's to come. And so... It is our seal. The Lord knows us because we are sealed by his spirit. You're not getting into 
being the bride of Christ without the seal of the Holy Ghost on you. Nobody wants to, to agree with that. You got, you got the Holy Ghost? Amen. That's your seal. You should be glad. Another thing that the Holy Ghost is, is rest. If you go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 28. Isaiah 28, verses 11 and 12. Now, Isaiah is prophesying about the coming of a rest. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. Now, what was the rest? For with the stammering lip and another tongue, this is the rest. How do we know we have the Holy Ghost? Speaking in tongues, as the Spirit gives utterance, that's how we know that we have what Isaiah is talking because we've had the stammering lip and another tongue. And this is the rest where, where he may cause the weary to rest. And Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What is the rest? It's the Holy Ghost that he was talking about. If you don't believe it, let us go to the book of Hebrews chapter 4, and starting at verse 1. Hebrews 4 and verse 1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us, was the gospel preach? Who's the us? Before you answer that, let's just go a little bit further. As well as unto them. Now, who's the us that the apostle is talking about here? For unto us was the gospel preach. The Jews is the us. For unto us, the Jews, was the gospel preached as well as unto them, the Gentiles. But the word preached did not profit them. The them here is talking about the Jews that he referred to at the beginning. So the gospel was preached to us, but it didn't profit us. It didn't profit the Jews. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn uh, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So, Jesus, the Bible says that he was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It was already done as far as God is concerned. It was done. There was a rest for the people of God. Let's just read on. Go down to verse 7. Drop down to verse 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. We have entered into that rest after we have received the Holy Ghost. Rest from what? Rest from all the troubles that you're going through? Is that what he's talking about? You said rest from sin? In the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19 he says it like this. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, 
fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. You might not be bad, but you might be like it. And it's still considered that. So for those that would like to say, um, now I'm not gossiping, but, well, that comes under the and such like. If there's no benefit to it, if it's not profitable, if it's not helping something, then you're gossiping. You can say, I love the Lord and I love everybody, but I really got a problem with so-and-so. I just don't even like to speak to them. That's such like, you might can walk away and say, I don't hate them, but you got a problem that you're not willing to get over. There's a difference between hating and loving. There's even a middle ground. There's a neutral. I don't care one way or the other about you. If you live, I don't care if you die. I don't care. Well, that's such like. All right, I'll leave it alone. Saints is looking kind of. <laughs> Hebrews 4 and 10 says this. You don't have to turn to it. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. When you, and what is your works? The works of the flesh? We just read that. So you can't say that you're a fornicator, but you, uh, you got the Holy Ghost. No, you don't. You ain't got that rest because you're still laboring in your sin. You're still laboring in your flesh. Does that make sense? Anytime we're doing contrary to what God has asked us to do and we know we shouldn't do it, how can you say that you're resting from your own works? You're not. All right. Another thing that the Holy Ghost does, and, and to answer the question here online, the, the question was, so middle ground is such like Middle ground when it comes to sin is such like. I don't, I don't go out and commit adultery. I've not touched anyone but my wife, but I look at pornography online. You see what I mean? I don't drink alcohol anymore, but I go around and hang out in the bar. I hang out with folks that drink and I try to kind of smell it when I get a chance. There was a man that got the Holy Ghost and he was, he, he, he was a smoker, he loved to smoke. He said he was walking down the street heading somewhere and the man in front of him lit up a cigar and, and the smell just kind of overwhelmed him. And he said when he realized what he was doing, he had walked past where he was going just so he could keep smelling the smoke. Now that's such like. Yes, sir. <laughs> he said someone said that uh there were times when they would, they would ride down the street and if they could smell reefer, they'd roll their window down to let the smell come in their car. Some stuff, when God saves you from it, you stay away from it. Period. If you have a problem, sisters, if you have a problem with wandering eyes, why would you watch soap operas? Okay, maybe I'll find something for the brothers. I know they'll give me an amen. amen. <laughs> the 
Bible says, flee youthful lust. And you go into the volleyball game, could care less about, about volleyball. You seen them little outfits them girls wear? Yeah. I ain't going to no volleyball games. And it's not because I'm interested in some young girl. I think some of the clothes they're wearing is a little bit scandalous. But when you find yourself going up to the volleyball game, I'm going to support the local teams. You don't go to nothing but volleyball? No, 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 no. That's a such like. You need to stay away from that kind of stuff. But you know what? You know you. All right. I'll move on. The brothers didn't even give me an amen on that. Another thing the Holy Ghost does is it gives life where there was death. St. John 10.10 10 says this. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come that ye might have life and that ye might have it just barely. No, more abundantly. I want you to not only have life, I want you to, to, to excel in life. Now, if he wants me to have life more abundantly, how come, how come I'm not rich? Because that's not the kind of life he's talking about. The kind of life he's talking about is the kind where in the midst of all kind of trouble, you can still have joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. You can do that. When you're suffering something and you know it's for the glory of God, you can still be happy. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, And you have to quicken who were dead, how? In trespasses and sins. It was your sins that had you dead. So the devil doesn't do anything but try to kill you. Sin is of the devil. Jesus said, but I come that you might have life. N not just barely hanging on. Every time you see something that you used to like doing, I don't know if I should stay saved or not. Pray for me. 20 years, pray for me. I almost backslid this week. He didn't come for you to be a straggler. He didn't come for you to almost make it. But for you to have life and to have it more abundantly. For you to have the Holy Ghost and not be walking around always in trouble. Always almost messing up. What's the point in having the Holy Ghost and you always almost messing up? Nobody? I mean, there is no point, is it? It's like, I can remember when I was struggling hard, struggling, struggling hard, and I would go in the store and give them my debit card, and they'd swipe it, and if it made a funny beeping sound, I panicked. I wasn't sure if I was negative, if my card wasn't working. And I wasn't one of those kind of folks that put on a good show. What? Swipe it again. I wasn't like that. Right now, as it stands, I, I, don't, I don't like them machines up at the, the, the pharmacy. You go in there and you swipe your card and boop, 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 make all kind of crazy noises. And I, I said, is there something wrong with your machine? She said, no, it just makes all that noise. There was a time when I, would, I was nervous. I go in and swipe and praying, Lord, please don't let this thing decline. I ain't thinking about that no more. I'm worth two, three hundred dollars. I'm going to swipe my card with pride. I'm not worried about that. There's other stuff I worry about now, but I'm not worried about that no more. I'm not struggling like that where it's always from week to week. Oh, Lord, please don't let them checks keep clear. Well, let me just say this, because you might be doing it. You do know that you shouldn't be writing checks, and you don't have the money in your account. Don't write I-N-O-J in the corner of the check and anoint it with oil, and Lord, don't let them cash this until the money's in. Don't do that. You're wrong. If you don't have the money, you don't have it. Some folks play the game, well, I'm mailing it, and it's, not, it's got to go to California first, so it's going to take three days, and my check will be here on the fourth day, but 
they may not run it through the system right away. And even if they do it and it declines, they'll wait a day and then try to run it through again. Don't play like that because if you don't have the money, you shouldn't be writing the check. Now, having said that, there are some things that tempt us. But after you have passed that test so many times, it shouldn't be a problem like it was before. It shouldn't be a, it almost took me under every time. Every time I smell cigarettes, it almost makes me leave. Man, that, that's silly. Amen? Amen? All right. So he gives us life. Another thing that the Holy Ghost does, it gives us the power to bring ourself under control. Some folks is okay until something happens and they just lose control. In the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse number 13. For if ye live after the flesh, what's going to happen? You shall die. If you live after your flesh, ye shall. You're not dead yet, but you will die. You get the Holy Ghost and you keep doing what your flesh tells you to do, you're going to die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now, the word mortify means to kill. When something is dead, what can it do? You're right, nothing. Say what? Scare you. Scare you. <laughs> Amen. Yes, yeah, some, some folks are scared of dead people. But they ain't the ones to fear. It's the other ones. Amen. Yeah. You you at your safest around somebody dead. Because they ain't going to bother with you. It's the one. There are times when people will hit a deer with their car. And they tell you, don't get out and go over there and look at the deer. Because if he ain't completely dead, he'll kill you. His hooves will cut you to ribbons. And if it's a buck, his, his horns, his antlers, he can spear you with that and kill you quick. Because he's almost dead. That's the one that's the most dangerous. A deer that's not dead, that's fully alive, will run from you. But one that's almost dead, he's scared. He'll panic. He'll do anything he can to get you away from him. He'll kill you. It's the same thing with people. You can fool around with some folks in the world that's good in the world. They ain't bothering with you. You can fool around with saints that have killed their flesh. They ain't bothering with you. But the one that's almost dead, that still got a little kick in them, they'll tear you up. They're the ones that'll come in and say, if they get up and lead testimony service, I'm walking out. That's the one that's almost dead. If I have to hear her sing one more time, I'm not coming back to church. They almost did. Those are the ones that will hurt you. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27 says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others... I myself should be a castaway. Paul, Paul is saying then that it is possible for him to have received the Holy Ghost to not allow it to help him keep his body under control and for him to then backslide, to be cast away from God. I don't understand folks that feel like they can do whatever they want to do and it's okay. God's not going to punish them. Yes, he will. Last thing is proof of adoption. Now, I've got 22 things. I'm sure there's more. 
Romans chapter 8 and verse 15 says this, For ye have not re received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You might be a foster parent raising a child. You might have a neighbor kid that's at your house every day, but that's not your child. They may live with you, but they can't call you mama and daddy. Amen. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You may have someone that lives with you and folks think it's your child. But they're not. You want to find out real quick? Take them to the hospital. Are you their parent? I had, I had the school do this to me. I took my, I, I, I was, tried to be as active as I could with my children at school. Each year when I took vacation, I would spend a day or two days with each one of my girls while they were in school. They didn't like it, but I did. I went to register my kids for school, and I put, got two of them registered, and I went over to get the other one. And the lady was, okay, the child's name, and I gave her her name. She said, all right, and the address, I gave her the address. All right, father's name. I said, David Johnson. She said, her biological father's name. Because she's a different complexion than me, they didn't think it was my child. So they wanted to know, no, 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 no. Who's the one that's got the legal right to her? I said, I am her natural father. Oh, oh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It doesn't take long to find out legally what rights you have and don't have with a child when they're not your child. You can't claim God to be your father and you don't have the spirit of adoption. You can't do that. There's folks drunk, high, getting up out the bed with some woman that ain't their wife and talking about, I thank my father in heaven. He's not your father. You don't have the spirit of adoption. If you did, you would act like one of his kids. Does that make sense? Yes. You don't just do whatever you want to do and God's my father. And I'll tell you something I really don't like to hear. Yes, I think I, I, I had to have a talk with the big man upstairs. Heaven is not upstairs and God is not the big man. He's not. He's God. It's sad when we degrade God down to our own level. He's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. That's what the scripture says. God is not a man. But he certainly can be your father if you have the Holy Ghost. Then we have the spirit of adoption and now we have the right to cry Abba which means father now we have a right to call him father that's who my dad is is God how do you know because he's already purchased me and covered me with his seal I've got the spirit of adoption he adopted me now I can call him my dad. When you adopt a child, you are legally, you don't have to tell nobody that they're adopted. You can say, this is my child. This is my daughter. This is my son. You can say that. Because now you've adopted them. The law says, that's your child now. In all technical matters, if you die, and that's the only blood relative or only relative you got alive, that child gets everything as if he was your blood. If there's more, they get a portion just like everybody else. All the rest of the family, all the rest of the brothers and sisters, they get an equal portion. There's no, well, you get 50%, but you, or you get 60%, but you only get 40 because you was adopted. No, once you adopted, that's it. So when we get the Holy Ghost, we are adopted by God, by the spirit of adoption. We're his. Now we can call him dad. We can call him our father. And he will treat us like we are his children. Amen? Amen. All right. I, I hope if you 
or a note taker, I hope you wrote down these things. I hope you wrote down, and maybe we'll put it in the next newsletter, the 22 things to outline. These are the things that the Holy Ghost will do for us. This is how it helps us. This is how it, it blesses us. This is how we overcome because God has given us the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. All right. Any questions? Not necessarily on the subject. You don't have to be on the subject, but if you have a question, amen. All right, stand up. <laughs>